U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 13, Antebellum Idealism and Reform Impulses, 1820-1860 Introduction This masthead for the abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator shows two Americas. On the left is the southern version where enslaved people are being sold. On the right, free black people enjoy the blessing of liberty. Reflecting the role of evangelical Protestantism in reforms such as abolition, the image features Jesus as the central figure. The caption reads, I come to break the bonds of the oppressor, and below the masthead, our country is the world, our countrymen are all mankind. The reform efforts of the antebellum years, including abolitionism, aimed to perfect the national destiny and redeem the souls of individual Americans. A great deal of optimism, fueled by evangelical Protestantism revivalism, underwrote the moral crusades of the first half of the 19th century. Some reformers targeted what they perceived as the shallow, materialistic, and democratic market culture of the United States, and advocated a stronger sense of individualism and self-reliance. Others dreamed of a more equal society and establish their own idealistic communities. Still others, who viewed slavery as the most serious flaw in American life, labored to end the institution. Women's rights, temperance, health reforms, and a host of other efforts also came to the forefront during the heyday of reform in the 1830s and 1840s. Thirteen point one. An Awakening of Religion and Individualism Learning Objectives By the end of this section, you will be able to Explain the connection between Evangelical Protestantism and the Second Great Awakening Describe the message of the Transcendentalists Protestantism shaped the views of the vast majority of Americans in the antebellum years. The influence of religion only intensified during the decades before the Civil War as religious camp meetings spread the word that people could bring about their own salvation, a direct contradiction to the Calvinist doctrine of predestination. Alongside this religious fervor, transcendentalists advocated a more direct knowledge of the self and an emphasis on individualism. The writers and thinkers devoted to transcendentalism, as well as the reactions against it, created a trove of writings an outpouring that has been termed the American Renaissance. The Second Great Awakening The reform efforts of the antebellum era sprang from the Protestant revival fervor that found expression in what historians refer to as the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening of Evangelical Protestantism had taken place in the 1730s and 1740s. The Second Great Awakening emphasized an emotional religious style in which sinners grappled with their unworthy nature before concluding that they were born again, that is, turning away from their sinful past and devoting themselves to living a righteous, Christ-centered life. This emphasis on personal salvation, with its rejection of predestination, the Calvinist concept that God selected only a chosen few for salvation, was the religious embodiment of the Jacksonian celebration of the individual. Itinerant ministers preached the message of the awakening to hundreds of listeners at outdoors revival meetings. The burst of religious enthusiasm that began in Kentucky and Tennessee in the 1790s and early 1800s among Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians owed much to the uniqueness of the early decades of the Republic. These years saw swift population growth, broad Western expansion, and the rise of participatory democracy. These political and social changes made many people anxious, and the more egalitarian, emotional, and individualistic religious practices of the Second Great Awakening 
provided relief and comfort for Americans experiencing rapid change. The awakening soon spread to the East, where it had a profound impact on Congregationalists and Presbyterians. The thousands swept up in the movement believed in the possibility of creating a much better world. Many adopted millennialism, the fervent belief that the kingdom of God would be established on earth and that God would reign on earth for a thousand years, characterized by harmony and Christian morality. Those drawn to the message of the Second Great Awakening yearned for stability, decency, and goodness in the new and turbulent American Republic. The Second Great Awakening also brought significant changes to American culture. Church membership doubled in the years between 1800 and 1835. Several new groups formed to promote and strengthen the message of religious revival. The American Bible Society, founded in 1816, distributed Bibles in an effort to ensure that every family had access to the sacred text, while the American Sunday School Union, established in 1824, focused on the religious education of children and published religious materials specifically for young readers. In 1825, the American Tract Society formed with the goal of disseminating the Protestant revival message in a flurry of publications. Missionaries and circuit riders, ministers without a fixed congregation, brought the message of the awakening across the United States, including into the lives of the enslaved. The revival spurred many slaveholders to begin encouraging the people they enslaved to become Christians. Previously, Many slaveholders feared allowing the enslaved to convert, due to a belief that Christians could not be enslaved, and because of the fear that enslaved people might use Christian principles to oppose their enslavement. However, by the 1800s, Americans established a legal foundation for the enslavement of Christians. Also, by this time, slaveholders had come to believe that if enslaved people learned the right, that is, white form of Christianity, then they would be more obedient and hardworking. Allowing enslaved people access to Christianity also served to ease the consciences of Christian slaveholders who argued that slavery was divinely ordained, yet it was a faith that also required slaveholders to bring enslaved people to the truth. Also important to this era was the creation of African-American forms of worship as well as African-American churches, such as the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first independent black Protestant church in the United States. Formed in the 1790s by Richard Allen, the African Methodist Episcopal Church advanced the African-American effort to express their faith apart from white Methodists. In the Northeast, Presbyterian minister Charles Grandison Finney rose to prominence as one of the most important evangelicals in the movement. Born in 1792 in Western New York, Finney studied to be a lawyer until 1821, when he experienced a religious conversion and thereafter devoted himself to revivals. He led revival meetings in New York and Pennsylvania, but his greatest success occurred after he accepted a ministry in Rochester, New York in 1830. At the time, Rochester was a boomtown because the Erie Canal had brought a lively shipping business. The new middle class, an outgrowth of the Industrial Revolution, embraced Finney's message. It fit perfectly with their understanding of themselves as people shaping their own destiny. Workers also latched onto the message that they too could control their salvation, spiritually and perhaps financially as well. Western New York gained a reputation as the Burned Over District, a reference to the intense flames of religious fervor that swept the area during the Second Great Awakening. Transcendentalism Beginning in the 1820s, a new intellectual movement known as Transcendentalism began to grow in the Northeast. In this context, to transcend means to go beyond the ordinary sensory world to grasp personal insights and gain appreciation of a deeper reality, and transcendentalists believed that all people could attain an understanding of the world that surpassed rational, sensory experience. 
transcendentalists were critical of mainstream American culture. They reacted against the age of mass democracy in Jacksonian America, what Tocqueville called the tyranny of majority, by arguing for greater individualism against conformity. European Romanticism, a movement in literature and art that stressed emotion over cold, calculating reason, also influenced transcendentalists in the United States, especially the transcendentalist celebration of the uniqueness of individual feelings. Ralph Waldo Emerson emerged as the leading figure of this movement. Born in Boston in 1803, Emerson came from a religious family. His father served as a Unitarian minister, and after graduating from Harvard Divinity School in the 1820s, Emerson followed in his father's footsteps. However, after his wife died in 1831, he left the clergy. On a trip to Europe in 1832, he met leading figures of Romanticism who rejected the hyper-rationalism of the Enlightenment, emphasizing instead emotion and the sublime. When Emerson returned home the following year, he began giving lectures on his Romanticism-influenced ideas. In 1836, he published Nature, an essay arguing that humans can find their true spirituality in nature, not in the everyday bustling working world of Jacksonian democracy and industrial transformation. In 1841, Emerson published his essay Self-Reliance, which urged readers to think for themselves and reject the mass conformity and mediocrity he believed had taken root in American life. In this essay, he wrote, Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist, demanding that his readers be true to themselves and not blindly follow a herd mentality. Emerson's ideas dovetailed with those of the French aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote about the tyranny of the majority in his democracy in America. Tocqueville, like Emerson, expressed concern that a powerful majority could overpower the will of individuals. Emerson's ideas struck a chord with a class of literate adults who also were dissatisfied with mainstream American life and searching for greater spiritual meaning. Many writers were drawn to transcendentalism, and they started to express its ideas through new stories, poems, essays, and articles. The ideas of transcendentalism were able to permeate American thought and culture through a prolific print culture, which allowed magazines and journals to be widely disseminated. Among those attracted to Emerson's ideas was his friend Henry David Thoreau, whom he encouraged to write about his own ideas. Thoreau placed a special emphasis on the role of nature as a gateway to the transcendentalist goal of greater individualism. In 1848, Thoreau gave a lecture in which he argued that individuals must stand up to governmental injustice, a topic he chose because of his disgust over the Mexican-American War and slavery. In 1849, he published his lecture, Civil Disobedience, and urged readers to refuse to support a government that was immoral. In 1854, he published Walden, or Life in the Woods, a book about the two years he spent in a small cabin on Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts. Thoreau had lived there as an experiment in living apart, but not too far apart, from his conformist neighbors. Margaret Fuller also came to prominence as a leading transcendentalist and advocate for women's equality. Fuller was a friend of Emerson and Thoreau and other intellectuals of her day. Because she was a woman, she could not attend Harvard, as it was a male-only institution for undergraduate students until 1973. However, she was later granted the use of the library there because of her towering intellect. In 1840, she became the editor of The Dial, a transcendentalist journal, and she later found employment as a book reviewer for the New York Tribune newspaper. Tragically, in 1850, she died at the age of 40 in a shipwreck off Fire Island, New York. Walt Whitman also added to the transcendentalist movement, most notably with his 1855 publication of 12 poems, entitled Leaves of Grass, which celebrated the subjective experience of the individual. 
One of the poems, Song of Myself, amplified the message of individualism. But by uniting the individual with all other people through a transcendent bond. Some critics took issue with transcendentalism's emphasis on rampant individualism by pointing out the destructive consequences of compulsive human behavior. Herman Melville's novel, Moby Dick, or The Whale emphasized the perils of individual obsession by telling the tale of Captain Ahab's single-minded quest to kill a white whale, Moby Dick, which had destroyed Ahab's original ship and caused him to lose one of his legs. Edgar Allan Poe, a popular author, critic, and poet, decried the so-called poetry of the so-called transcendentalists. These American writers who questioned transcendentalism illustrate the underlying tension between individualism and conformity in American life. Americana, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself Walt Whitman was a poet associated with the transcendentalists. His 1855 poem, Song of Myself, shocked many when it was first published, but it has been called one of the most influential poems in American literature. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air. Born here of parents born here, from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now, thirty-seven years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease, not, till death. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least, nor do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. I too am not a bit tamed, I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless, and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. What images does Whitman use to describe himself and the world around him? What might have been shocking about this poem in 1855? Why do you think it has endured? Thirteen point two, antebellum communal experiments. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to identify similarities and differences among utopian groups of the antebellum era. Explain how religious utopian communities differed from non-religious ones. Prior to eighteen fifteen, in the years before the market and industrial revolution, most Americans lived on farms where they produced much of the foods and goods they used. This largely pre-capitalist culture centered on large family units whose members all lived in the same towns, counties, and parishes. Economic forces unleashed after 1815, however, forever altered that world. More and more people now bought their food and goods in the thriving market economy, a shift that opened the door to a new way of life. These economic transformations generated various reactions. Some people were nostalgic for what they viewed as simpler, earlier times, whereas others were willing to try new ways of living and working. In the early 19th century, experimental communities sprang up, created by men and women who hoped not just to create a better way of life, but to recast American civilization so that greater equality and harmony would prevail. Indeed, some of these reformers envisioned the creation of alternative ways of living, where people could attain perfection in human relations. The exact number of these societies is unknown because many of them were so short-lived. But the movement reached its apex in the 1840s. Religious Utopian Societies Most of those attracted to utopian communities had been profoundly influenced by evangelical Protestantism especially the Second Great Awakening. However, their experience of revivalism had left them wanting to further reform society. The communities they formed and joined 
adhered to various socialist ideas and were considered radical because members wanted to create a new social order, not reform the old. German Protestant migrants formed several pietistic societies, communities that stressed transformative individual religious experience or piety over religious rituals and formality. One of the earliest of these, the Ephrata Cloister in Pennsylvania, was founded by a charismatic leader named Conrad Beisel in the 1730s. By the antebellum era, it was the oldest communal experiment in the United States. Its members devoted themselves to spiritual contemplation and a disciplined work regime while they awaited the millennium. They wore homespun rather than buying cloth or pre-made clothing and encouraged celibacy. Although the Afreda cloister remained small, it served as an early example of the type of community that antebellum reformers hoped to create. In 1805, a second German religious society, led by George Rapp, took root in Pennsylvania with several hundred members called Rappites who encouraged celibacy and adhered to the socialist principle of holding all goods in common, as opposed to allowing individual ownership. They not only built the town of Harmony, but also produced surplus goods to sell to the outside world. In 1815, the group sold its Pennsylvanian holdings and moved to Indiana, establishing New Harmony on a 20,000-acre plot along the Wabash River. In 1825, members returned to Pennsylvania and established themselves in the town called Economy. The Shakers provide another example of a community established with a religious mission. The Shakers started in England as an outgrowth of the Quaker religion in the middle of the 18th century. Anne Lee, a leader of the group in England, emigrated to New York in the 1770s, having experienced a profound religious awakening that convinced her that she was mother in Christ. She taught that God was both male and female. Jesus embodied the male side, while Mother Anne, as she came to be known by her followers, represented the female side. Two Shakers in both England and the United States, Mother Anne represented the completion of divine revelation and the beginning of the millennium of heaven on earth. In practice, men and women in Shaker communities were held as equals, a radical departure at the time, and women often outnumbered men. Equality extended to the possession of material goods as well. No one could hold private property. Shaker communities aimed for self-sufficiency, raising food and making all that was necessary, including furniture that emphasized excellent workmanship as a substitute for worldly pleasure. The defining features of the Shakers were their spiritual mysticism and their prohibition of sexual intercourse which they held as an example of a lesser spiritual life and a source of conflict between women and men. Rapturous shaker dances, for which the group gained notoriety, allowed for emotional release. The high point of the shaker movement came in the 1830s, when about 6,000 members populated communities in New England, New York, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Another religious utopian experiment, the Oneida community, began with the teachings of John Humphrey Noyes, a Vermonter who had graduated from Dartmouth, Andover Theological Seminary, and Yale. The Second Great Awakening exerted a powerful effect on him, and he came to believe in perfectionism, the idea that it is possible to be perfect and free of sin. Noyes claimed to have achieved this state of perfection in 1834. Noyes applied his idea of perfection to relationships between men and women, earning notoriety for his unorthodox views on marriage and sexuality. Beginning in his hometown of Putney, Vermont, he began to advocate what he called complex marriage, a form of communal marriage in which women and men who had achieved perfection could engage in sexual intercourse without sin. Noyes also promoted male continence whereby men would not ejaculate, thereby freeing women from pregnancy and the difficulty of determining paternity when they had many partners. Intercourse became fused with spiritual power among Noyes and his followers. The concept of complex marriage 
scandalized the townspeople in Putney. So Noyes and his followers removed to Oneida, New York. Individuals who wanted to join the Oneida community underwent a tough screening process to weed out those who had not reached a state of perfection, which Noyes believed promoted self-control, not out-of-control behavior. The goal was a balance between individuals in a community of love and respect. The perfectionist community Noyes envisioned ultimately dissolved in 1881, although the Oneida community itself continues to this day. The most successful religious utopian community to arise in the antebellum years was begun by Joseph Smith. Smith came from a large Vermont family that had not prospered in the new market economy and moved to the town of Palmyra in the burned-over district of western New York. In 1823, Smith indicated that he had been visited by the angel Moroni, who told him the location of a trove of golden plates or tablets. During the late 1820s, Smith translated the writing on the golden plates, and in 1830, he published his finding as the Book of Mormon. That same year, he organized the Church of Christ, the progenitor of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then popularly known as Mormons. He presented himself as a prophet and aimed to recapture what he viewed as the purity of the primitive Christian church, purity that had been lost over the centuries. Smith emphasized the importance of families being led by fathers. His vision of a reinvigorated patriarchy resonated with men and women who had not thrived during the market revolution, and his claims attracted those who hoped for a better future. Smith's new church placed great stress on work and discipline. He aimed to create a new Jerusalem where the church exercised oversight of its members. Smith's claims of translating the golden plates antagonized his neighbors in New York. Difficulties with anti-Mormons led him and his followers to move to Kirtland, Ohio in 1831. By 1838, as the United States experienced continued economic turbulence following the Panic of 1837, Smith and his followers were facing financial collapse after a series of efforts in banking and money-making ended in disaster. They moved to Missouri, but trouble soon developed there as well, as citizens reacted against the church members' beliefs. Actual fighting broke out in 1838, and the 10,000 or so members of the Church of Jesus Christ removed to Nauvoo, Illinois, where they founded a new center of Mormonism. By the 1840s, Nauvoo boasted a population of 30,000, making it the largest utopian community in the United States. Thanks to some important conversions among powerful citizens in Illinois, the church members had virtual autonomy in Nauvoo, which they used to create the largest armed force in the state. Smith also received further revelations there, including one that allowed male church leaders to practice polygamy. He also declared that all of North and South America would be the new Zion and announced that he would run for president in the 1844 election. Smith and the church members' convictions and practices generated a great deal of opposition from neighbors in surrounding towns. Smith was arrested for treason for his role in the destruction of the printing press of a newspaper that criticized Mormonism. And while he was in prison, an anti-Mormon mob stormed into his cell and killed him. Brigham Young then assumed leadership of the group, which he led to a permanent home in what is now Salt Lake City, Utah. Secular Utopian Societies Not all utopian communities were prompted by the religious fervor of the Second Great Awakening. Some were outgrowths of the intellectual ideas of the time, such as Romanticism, with its emphasis on the importance of individualism over conformity. One of these, Brook Farm, took shape in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, in the 1840s. It was founded by George Ripley, a transcendentalist from Massachusetts. In the summer of 1841, this utopian community gained support from Boston-area thinkers and writers, an intellectual group that included many important transcendentalists. Brook Farm is best characterized as a community of intensely individualistic personalities who combined manual labor, 
such as the growing and harvesting food, with intellectual pursuits. They opened a school that specialized in the liberal arts rather than rote memorization and published a weekly journal called The Harbinger, which was devoted to social and political progress. Members of Brook Farm never totaled more than 100, but it won renown largely because of the luminaries, such as Emerson and Thoreau, whose names were attached to it. Nathaniel Hawthorne, a Massachusetts writer who took issue with some of the transcendentalists' claims, was a founding member of Brook Farm, and he fictionalized some of his experiences in his novel The Blythedale Romance. In 1846, a fire destroyed the main building of Brook Farm, and already hampered by financial problems, the Brook Farm experiment came to an end in 1847. Robert Owen, a British industrialist, helped inspire those who dreamed of a more equitable world in the face of the changes brought about by industrialization. Owen had risen to prominence before he turned 30 by running cotton mills in New Lanark, Scotland. These were considered the most successful cotton mills in Great Britain. Owen was very uneasy about the conditions of workers, and he devoted both his life and his fortune to trying to create cooperative societies where workers would lead meaningful, fulfilled lives. Unlike the founders of many utopian communities, he did not gain inspiration from religion. His vision derived instead from his faith in human reason to make the world better. When the Rappite community in Harmony, Indiana, decided to sell its holdings and relocate to Pennsylvania, Owen seized the opportunity to put his ideas into action. In 1825, he bought the 20,000-acre parcel in Indiana and renamed it New Harmony. After only a few years, however, a series of bad decisions by Owen and infighting over issues like the elimination of private property led to the dissolution of the community. But Owen's ideas of cooperation and support inspired other Owenite communities in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. A French philosopher who advocated the creation of a new type of utopian community, Charles Fourier, also inspired American readers, notably Arthur Brisbane, who popularized Fourier's ideas in the United States. Fourier emphasized collective effort by groups of people or associations. Members of the association would be housed in large buildings or phalanxes, a type of communal living arrangement. Converts to Fourier's ideas about a new science of living published and lectured vigorously. They believed labor was a type of capital, and the more unpleasant the job, the higher the wages should be. Fourierists in the United States created some 28 communities between 1841 and 1858. But by the late 1850s, the movement had run its course in the United States. Thirteen point three reforms to human health learning objectives by the end of this section you will be able to explain the different reforms aimed at improving the health of the human body describe the various factions and concerns within the temperance movement antebellum reform efforts aimed at perfecting the spiritual and social worlds of individuals and as an outgrowth of those concerns some reformers moved in the direction of ensuring the health of american citizens Many Americans viewed drunkenness as a major national problem, and the battle against alcohol and the many problems associated with it led many to join the temperance movement. Other reformers offered plans to increase physical well-being, instituting plans designed to restore vigor. Still, others celebrated new sciences that would unlock the mysteries of human behavior and, by doing so, advance American civilization. Temperance According to many antebellum reformers, intemperance, drunkenness, stood as the most troubling problem in the United States, one that eroded morality, Christianity, and played a starring role in corrupting American democracy. Americans consumed huge quantities of liquor in the early 1800s, including gin, whiskey, rum, and brandy. Indeed, scholars agree that the rate of consumption of these drinks during the first three decades of the 1800s reached levels that have never been equaled in American history. 
A variety of reformers created organizations devoted to temperance, that is, moderation or self-restraint. Each of these organizations had its own distinct orientation and target audience. The earliest ones were formed in the 1810s in New England. The Massachusetts Society for the Suppression of Intemperance and the Connecticut Society for the Reformation of Morals were both formed in 1813. Protestant ministers led both organizations, which enjoyed support from New Englanders who clung to the ideals of the Federalist Party and later the Whigs. These early temperance societies called on individuals to lead pious lives and avoid sin, including the sin of overindulging in alcohol. They called not for the eradication of drinking, but for a more restrained and genteel style of imbibing. In the 1820s, Temperance gained ground largely through the work of Presbyterian minister Lyman Beecher. In 1825, Beecher delivered six sermons on temperance that were published the following year as Six Sermons on the Nature, Occasions, Signs, Evils, and Remedy of Intemperance. He urged total abstinence from hard liquor and called for the formation of voluntary associations to bring forth a new day without spirits whiskey, rum, gin, brandy. Lyman's work enjoyed a wide readership and support from leading Protestant ministers as well as the emerging middle class. Temperance fit well with the middle class ethic of encouraging hard work and a sober workforce. In 1826, the American Temperance Society was formed and by the early 1830s, thousands of similar societies had sprouted across the country. Members originally pledged to shun only hard liquor. By 1836, however, leaders of the temperance movement, including Beecher, called for a more comprehensive approach. Thereafter, most temperance societies advocated total abstinence. No longer would beer and wine be tolerated. Such total abstinence from alcohol is known as teetotalism. Teetotalism led to disagreement within the movement and a loss of momentum for reform after 1836. However, temperance enjoyed a revival in the 1840s as a new type of reformer took up the cause against alcohol. The engine driving the new burst of enthusiastic temperance reform was the Washington Temperance Society, named in deference to George Washington, which organized in 1840. The leaders of the Washingtonians came not from the ranks of Protestant ministers, but from the working class. They aimed their efforts at confirmed alcoholics, unlike the early temperance advocates, who mostly targeted the middle class. Washingtonians welcomed the participation of women and children, as they cast alcohol as the destroyer of families, and those who joined the group took a public pledge of teetotalism. Americans flocked to the Washingtonians, as many as 600,000 had taken the pledge by 1844. The huge surge in membership had much to do with the style of this reform effort. The Washingtonians turned temperance into theater by dramatizing the plight of those who fell into the habit of drunkenness. Perhaps the most famous fictional drama put forward by the temperance movement was Ten Nights in a Bar Room, 1853 a novel that became the basis for popular theatrical productions. The Washingtonians also sponsored picnics and parades that drew whole families into the movement. The group's popularity quickly waned in the late 1840s and early 1850s when questions arose about the effectiveness of merely taking a pledge. Many who had done so soon relapsed into alcoholism. Still, by that time, temperance had risen to a major political issue. Reformers lobbied for laws limiting or prohibiting alcohol, and states began to pass the first temperance laws. The earliest, an 1838 law in Massachusetts, prohibited the sale of liquor in quantities less than 15 gallons, a move designed to make it difficult for ordinary workmen of modest means to buy spirits. The law was repealed in 1840, but Massachusetts towns then took the initiative by passing local laws banning alcohol. In 1845, close to 100 towns in the state went dry. An 1839 Mississippi law 
similar to Massachusetts' original law, outlawed the sale of less than a gallon of liquor. Mississippi's law illustrates the national popularity of temperance. Regional differences notwithstanding, citizens in northern and southern states agreed on the issue of alcohol. Nonetheless, northern states pushed hardest for outlawing alcohol. Maine enacted the first statewide prohibition law in 1851. New England, New York, and states in the Midwest passed local laws in the 1850s, prohibiting the sale and manufacture of intoxicating beverages. Americana The Drunkard's Progress This 1840 temperance illustration charts the path of destruction for those who drink. The step-by-step -step progression reads, Step 1. A glass with a friend. Step 2. A glass to keep the cold out. Step 3. A glass too much. Step 4. Drunk and riotous. Step 5. The summit attained. Jolly companions, a confirmed drunkard. Step 6. Poverty and disease. Step 7. Forsaken by friends. Step 8. Desperation and crime. Step 9. Death by suicide. Who do you think was the intended audience for this engraving? How do you think different audiences, children, drinkers, non-drinkers, would react to the story it tells? Do you think it is an effective piece of propaganda? Why or why not? Reforms for the Body and the Mind Beyond temperance, other reformers looked to ways to maintain and improve health in a rapidly changing world. Without professional medical organizations or standards, health reform went in many different directions. Although the American Medical Association was formed in 1847, it did not have much power to oversee medical practices. Too often, quack doctors prescribed regimens and medicines that did far more harm than good. Sylvester Graham stands out as a leading light among the health reformers in the antebellum years. A Presbyterian minister, Graham began his career as a reformer, lecturing against the evils of strong drink. He combined an interest in temperance with vegetarianism and sexuality into what he called a science of human life, calling for a regimented diet of more vegetables, fruits and grain, and no alcohol, meat, or spices. Graham advocated baths and cleanliness in general to preserve health. Hydropathy, or water cures for various ailments, became popular in the United States in the 1840s and 1850s. He also viewed masturbation and excessive sex as a cause of disease and debility. His ideas led him to create what he believed to be a perfect food that would maintain health, the Graham Cracker, which he invented in 1829. Followers of Graham, known as Grahamites, established boarding houses where lodgers followed the recommended strict diet and sexual regimen. During the early 19th century, reformers also interested themselves in the workings of the mind in an effort to better understand the effects of a rapidly changing world awash with religious revivals and democratic movements. Phrenology, the mapping of the cranium to specific human attributes, stands as an early type of science related to what would become psychology and devoted to understanding how the mind worked. Although their theories would ultimately be proven wrong, phrenologists believed that the mind contained 37 faculties, the strengths or weaknesses of which could be determined by a close examination of the size and shape of the cranium. Initially developed in Europe by Franz Joseph Gall, a German doctor, phrenology first came to the United States in the 1820s. In the 1830s and 1840s, it grew in popularity as lecturers crisscrossed the Republic. It was sometimes used as an educational test, and like temperance, it also became a form of popular entertainment. While phrenology is now considered pseudoscience, Gall's assertion that different parts of the brain were responsible for different functions is viewed as an important scientific advance. The popularity of phrenology offers us some insight into the emotional world of the antebellum United States. Its popularity speaks to the desire of those living in a rapidly changing society, where older ties to community and family were being challenged to understand one another. 
it appeared to offer a way to quickly recognize an otherwise unknown individual as a readily understood set of human faculties. Thirteen point four, addressing slavery. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to identify the different approaches to reforming the institution of slavery. Describe the abolitionist movement in the early to mid nineteenth century. The issue of slavery proved especially combustible in the reform-minded antebellum United States. Those who hoped to end slavery had different ideas about how to do it. Some could not envision a biracial society and advocated sending black people to Africa or the Caribbean. Others promoted the use of violence as the best method to bring American slavery to an end. Abolitionists, by contrast, worked to end slavery and to create a multiracial society of equals using moral arguments, moral suasion, to highlight the immorality of slavery. In keeping with the religious fervor of the era, Abolitionists hope to bring about a mass conversion in public opinion to end slavery. Reforms to slavery. An early and popular reform to slavery was colonization, or a movement advocating the displacement of African Americans out of the country, usually to Africa. In 1816, the Society for the Colonization of Free People of Color of America, also called the American Colonization Society or ACS, Was founded with this goal. Leading statesmen, including Thomas Jefferson, endorsed the idea of colonization. Members of the ACS did not believe that black and white people could live as equals, so they targeted the roughly 200,000 free black people in the United States for relocation to Africa. For several years after the ACS's founding, they raised money and pushed Congress for funds. In 1819, they succeeded in getting $100,000 from the federal government to further the colonization project. The ACS played a major role in the creation of the colony of Liberia, on the west coast of Africa. The country's capital, Monrovia, was named in honor of President James Monroe. The ACS stands as an example of how white reformers. Especially men of property and standing addressed the issue of slavery. Their efforts stand in stark contrast with other reformers' efforts to deal with slavery in the United States. Although rebellion stretches the definition of reform, another potential solution to slavery was its violent overthrow. Nat Turner's rebellion, one of the largest slave uprisings in American history. Took place in 1831 in Southampton County, Virginia. Like many enslaved people, Nat Turner was inspired by the evangelical Protestant fervor sweeping the republic. He preached to other enslaved people in Southampton County, gaining a reputation among them as a prophet. He organized them for rebellion, awaiting a sign to begin until an eclipse in August signaled that the appointed time had come. Turner and as many as seventy other enslaved people killed their enslavers and their families, a total of around sixty-five people. Turner eluded capture until late October, when he was tried, hanged, and then beheaded and quartered. Virginia put to death fifty-six others whom they believe to have taken part in the rebellion. White vigilantes and organized militias killed two hundred more. As panic swept through Virginia and the rest of the South, Nat Turner's rebellion provoked a heated discussion in Virginia over slavery. The Virginia legislature was already in the process of revising the state constitution, and some delegates advocated for an easier manumission process. The rebellion, however, rendered that reform impossible. Virginia and other slave states recommitted themselves to the institution of slavery. And defenders of slavery in the South increasingly blamed Northerners for provoking the enslaved to rebel. Literate, educated Black people, including David Walker, also favored rebellion. Walker was born a free Black man in North Carolina in 1796. He moved to Boston in the 1820s, lectured on slavery, and promoted the first African American newspaper. 
Freedom's Journal. He called for black people to actively resist slavery and to use violence if needed. He published An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World in 1829, denouncing the scheme of colonization and urging black people to fight for equality in the United States, to take action against racism. Walker died months after the publication of his appeal, and debate continues to this day over the cause of his death. Many believe he was murdered. Walker became a symbol of hope to free people in the North, and a symbol of the terrors of literate, educated black people to the slaveholders of the South. My story, Nat Turner on his battle against slavery. Thomas R. Gray was a lawyer in Southampton, Virginia, where he visited Nat Turner in jail. He published The Confessions of Nat Turner, the leader of the late insurrection in Southampton, Virginia, as fully and voluntarily made to Thomas R. Gray in November 1831, after Turner had been executed. For as the blood of Christ had been shed on this earth, and had ascended to heaven for the salvation of sinners, and was now returning to earth again in the form of dew, it was plain to me that the Savior was about to lay down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and the great day of judgment was at hand. And on the 12th of May, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the Spirit instantly appeared to me, and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. Question, do you not find yourself mistaken now? Answer, was not Christ crucified, and by signs in the heavens that it would make known to me when I should commence the great work, and on the appearance of the sign, the eclipse of the sun last February, I should arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies with their own weapons. How did Turner interpret his fight against slavery? What did he mean by the serpent? Abolitionism Abolitionists took a far more radical approach to the issue of the slavery by using moral arguments to advocate its immediate elimination. They publicized the atrocities committed under slavery and aimed to create a society characterized by equality of black and white people. In a world of intense religious fervor, they hoped to bring about a mass awakening in the United States of the sin of slavery, confident that they could transform the national conscience against the South's peculiar institution. William Lloyd Garrison and Anti-Slavery Societies William Lloyd Garrison of Massachusetts distinguished himself as the leader of the abolitionist movement. Although he had once been in favor of colonization, he came to believe that such a scheme only deepened racism and perpetuated the sinful practices of his fellow Americans. In 1831, he founded the abolitionist newspaper The Liberator, whose first edition declared, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen, but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. White Virginians blamed Garrison for stirring up enslaved people and instigating slave rebellions like Nat Turner's. Garrison founded the New England Anti-Slavery Society in 1831 and the American Anti-Slavery Society, AASS, in 1833. By 1838, the AASS had 250,000 members, sometimes called Garrisonians. They rejected colonization as a racist scheme and opposed the use of violence to end slavery. Influenced by evangelical Protestantism, Garrison and other abolitionists believed in moral suasion, a technique of appealing to the conscience of the public, especially slaveholders. Moral suasion relied on dramatic narratives, often from formerly enslaved people, about the horrors of slavery, arguing that slavery destroyed families as children were sold and taken away from their mothers and fathers. 
moral suasion resonated with many women who condemned the sexual violence against enslaved women and the victimization of Southern white women by adulterous husbands. Garrison also preached immediatism, the moral demand to take immediate action to end slavery. He wrote of equal rights and demanded that black people be treated as equal to white people. He appealed to women and men, black and white, to join the fight. The abolition press, which produced hundreds of tracts, helped to circulate moral suasion. Garrison and other abolitionists also used the power of petitions, sending hundreds of petitions to Congress in the early 1830s, demanding an end to slavery. Since most newspapers published congressional proceedings, the debate over abolition petitions reached readers throughout the nation. Although Garrison rejected the U.S. political system as a tool of slaveholders, other abolitionists believed mainstream politics could bring about their goal, and they helped create the Liberty Party in 1840. Its first candidate was James G. Burney, who ran for president that year. Burney epitomized the ideal and goals of the abolitionist movement. Born in Kentucky in 1792, Burney was an enslaver and searching for a solution to what he eventually condemned as the immorality of slavery, initially endorsed colonization. In the 1830s, however, he rejected colonization, released the people he enslaved, and began to advocate the immediate end of slavery. The Liberty Party did not generate much support and remained a fringe third party. Many of its supporters turned to the Free Soil Party in the aftermath of the Mexican Cession. The vast majority of Northerners rejected abolition entirely. Indeed, abolition generated a fierce backlash in the United States, especially during the age of Jackson, when racism saturated American culture. Anti-abolitionists in the North saw Garrison and other abolitionists as the worst of the worst, a threat to the Republic that might destroy all decency and order by upending time-honored distinctions between black and white people and between women and men. Northern anti-abolitionists feared that if slavery ended, the North would be flooded with black people who would take jobs from white people. Opponents made clear their resistance to Garrison and others of his ilk. Garrison nearly lost his life in 1835 when a Boston anti-abolitionist mob dragged him through the city streets. Anti-abolitionists tried to pass federal laws that made the distribution of abolitionist literature a criminal offense, fearing that such literature, with its engravings and simple language, could spark rebellious black people to action. Their sympathizers in Congress passed a gag rule that forbade the consideration of the many hundreds of petitions sent to Washington by abolitionists. A mob in Illinois killed an abolitionist named Elijah Lovejoy in 1837, and the following year, 10,000 protesters destroyed the abolitionists' newly built Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia, burning it to the ground. Frederick Douglass, many escaped enslaved people joined the abolitionist movement, including Frederick Douglass. Douglass was born in Maryland in 1818, escaping to New York in 1838. He later moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts with his wife. Douglass's commanding presence and powerful speaking skills electrified his listeners when he began to provide public lectures on slavery. He came to the attention of Garrison and others, who encouraged him to publish his story. In 1845, Douglas published Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave written by himself, in which he told about his life of slavery in Maryland. He identified by name the white people who had brutalized him, and for that reason, along with the mere act of publishing his story, Douglas had to flee the United States to avoid being murdered. British abolitionist friends bought his freedom from his Maryland owner, and Douglas returned to the United States. He began to publish his own abolitionist newspaper, North Star, in Rochester, New York. During the 1840s and 1850s, Douglas labored to bring about the end of slavery by telling the story of his life 
and highlighting how slavery destroyed families both black and white. My story. Frederick Douglass on slavery. Most white slaveholders frequently raped enslaved girls and women. In this excerpt, Douglass explains the consequences for the children fathered by white men and enslaved women. Slaveholders have ordained and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers. This is done too obviously to administer to their own lusts and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. The slaveholder, in cases not a few, sustains to his slaves the double relation of master and father. Such slaves, born of white masters, invariably suffer greater hardships. They are a constant offense to their mistress. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. And, cruel as the deed may strike anyone to be, for a man to sell his own children to human fleshmongers, for, unless he does this, he must not only whip them himself, but must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but few shades darker and ply the gory lash to his naked back. Frederick Douglass Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass An American Slave Written by Himself 1845 What moral complications did slavery unleash upon white slaveholders in the South, according to Douglass? What imagery does he use? Thirteen point five, women's rights. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the connections between abolition, reform, and antebellum feminism. Describe the ways antebellum women's movements were both traditional and revolutionary. Women took part in all the antebellum reforms, from transcendentalism to temperance to abolition. In many ways, traditional views of women as nurturers played a role in encouraging their participation. Women who joined the cause of temperance, for example, amplified their accepted role as moral guardians of the home. Some women advocated a much more expansive role for themselves and their peers by educating children and men in solid Republican principles. But it was their work in anti-slavery efforts that served as a springboard for women to take action against gender inequality. Many, especially Northern women, came to the conclusion that they, like enslaved people, were held in shackles in a society dominated by men. Even men who were progressive on some issues, such as abolition, adhered to traditional gender roles and demanded that their families did as well. Women also had very limited rights regarding property ownership and legal authority. Until states began passing property laws in the 1840s, husbands often fully controlled women's earnings, collection of debts, and rights regarding inheritance. The laws gave women some additional power, but that power was far from universal. Despite the radical nature of their effort to end slavery and create a biracial society, most abolitionist men clung to traditional notions of proper gender roles. White and black women, as well as free black men, were forbidden from occupying leadership positions in the ASS. Because women were not allowed to join the men in playing leading roles in the organization, they formed separate societies, such as the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, and similar groups. The Grimke Sisters Two leading abolitionist women, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, played major roles in combining the fight to end slavery with the struggle to achieve female equality. The sisters had been born into a prosperous slaveholding family in South Carolina. Both were caught up in the religious fervor of the Second Great Awakening, and they moved to the North and converted to Quakerism. In the mid-1830s, the sisters joined the abolitionist movement, and in 1837, they embarked on a public lecture tour, speaking about immediate abolition to promiscuous assemblies, that is, to audiences of women and men. This public action thoroughly scandalized respectable society, where it was unheard of for women to lecture to men. 
William Lloyd Garrison endorsed the Grimke sisters' public lectures, but other abolitionists did not. Their lecture tour served as a turning point. The reaction against them propelled the question of women's proper sphere in society to the forefront of public debate. The Declaration of Rights and Sentiments Participation in the abolitionist movement led some women to embrace feminism, the advocacy of women's rights. Lydia Maria Child, an abolitionist and feminist, observed, The comparison between women and the colored race is striking. Both have been kept in subjection by physical force. Other women, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, and Susan B. Anthony, agreed. In 1848, about 300 male and female feminists, many of them veterans of the abolition campaign, gathered at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York for a conference on women's rights that was organized by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It was the first of what became annual meetings that have continued to the present day. Attendees agreed to a Declaration of Rights and Sentiments based on the Declaration of Independence. It declared, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Republican Motherhood in the Antebellum Years Some Northern female reformers saw new and vital roles for their sex in the realm of education. They believed in traditional gender roles, viewing women as inherently more moral and nurturing than men. Because of these attributes, the feminists argued, women were uniquely qualified to take up the roles of educators of children. Catherine Beecher, the daughter of Lyman Beecher, pushed for women's roles as educators. In her 1845 book, The Duty of American Women to Their Country, she argued that the United States had lost its moral compass due to democratic excess. Both intelligence and virtue were imperiled in an age of riots and disorder. Women, she argued, could restore the moral center by instilling in children a sense of right and wrong. Beecher represented a northern, middle-class female sensibility. The home, especially the parlor, became the site of northern female authority. Defining American Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman? Born into slavery with the name Isabella Baumfrey, Sojourner Truth gained her freedom in 1826 and devoted much of the rest of her life to championing the causes of abolition and women's rights. She became the first black woman to win a lawsuit against a white person when she sued to gain the freedom of her son. Supported by leaders such as Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, Truth became a powerful voice in the abolition movement. But she was not afraid to challenge the prevailing notions about the rights and priorities of men and women within the abolition movement. Nor did she avoid challenging the notions about black people's priority within the women's rights movement. While some advocated with a step-by-step -step approach, first white women's suffrage, then black women's suffrage, Truth disagreed. In 1851, Truth delivered a speech at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Ultimately, it came to be titled, Ain't I a Woman? One of the most famous transcriptions of this speech was published in an 1851 edition of the Anti-Slavery Bugle by Reverend Marius Robinson, an Ohio abolitionist who had worked with truth. Another was published in an 1863 edition of the Anti-Slavery Standard by Francis Dana Gage, an abolitionist and feminist who presided over the convention at which truth spoke. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed, and can any man do more than that? I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and can eat as much too, if I can get it. I am strong as any man that is now. As for intellect, all I can say is, if woman have a pint and man a quart, why can't she have her little pint full? You need not be afraid to give us our rights for fear we will take too much, for we won't take more than our pint will hold. The poor men seem to be all in confusion and don't know what to do. Why, children, if you have woman's rights, give it to her and you will feel better. 
You will have your own rights, and they won't be so much trouble. I can't read, but I can hear. I have heard the Bible and have learned that Eve caused man to sin. Well, if woman upset the world, do give her a chance to set it right side up again. What might be the reasons for the different versions of Truth's speech? Could the different publishers have had different motivations? What is Truth's theme in this speech? This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.